right, and we are ready. Welcome to another episode of the Neoliberal Round Podcast, where we engage in thought-provoking discussions on a wide range of societal issues. I'm your host and creator, Ronaldo McKenzie. And on today's episode, we have two remarkable guests who was who was here before, um, and they're joining us for part two, um, for part two of, of the Urban Indian Heritage Society, talking about or unraveling American Indian heritage and rights. And, um, and we have with us Dr. Nolan Fontaine, who is co-founder and president of the Urban Indian Society, Heritage Society, and Phoenix Moon, who is a forensic genealogist, activist, and, and colonial historian, also a, co- a co-founder at the Urban Indian Heritage Society, UIHS for short. And we want to use this opportunity to welcome both of you to this amazing, powerful, and informative show. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you, Ronaldo. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, man, yeah, man. And, we appreciate um, you having us. <laughs> yeah, and it is a Sunday. And so, you know, we're looking, we're cooling out on a Sunday, having a discussion. I actually prepare this particular podcast episode. I really spent some time to prepare some questions, which I did some research and some more background research on Phoenix and Dr. Fontaine just to get ready for the show. And so, but before I get into, I actually sent you guys some questions, but I did not add this to the list. Um, the Urban Indian Heritage Society recently had an event called No Tree Without Roots Tour. And No Tree Without Roots Tour, I think it was August 4th, 5th, and 6th. And um, your first stop was in Chirar. I don't know if I'm getting it right. Chirar, South Carolina, which you guys said was historically known as the prettiest town in Dixie. And um, and so we want to know how was what was that all about? And um, and tell me about this town in Dixie and about this no tree without tour roots. How did it go? What's what's that all about? Well, Ronaldo, you have a remarkable way of going on off script. But unfortunately, <laughs> uh, we we are revamping our no tree with, without roots tour. Uh, we're in the process of um, looking at additional options um, for UIHS and No Grandmom Killers, which was the actual spark um, that kind of created UIHS back in 2020. Uh, so we still have South Carolina, Sharar, prettiest town in Dixie, still under consideration. And as you know, with at the beginning of the um, primary season, the Democrat and Republican primary season, we're ver- working very closely with our colleagues with American Indian political party, um, yeah. just to uh, shore up and safeguard what would actually be um, the best spot uh, to have our launch and kickoff. Okay, nice. Any any word on that, Phoenix? And tell me, this town in Dixie, what's it? You, uh, what's it like in Dixie? What's going on there? Why is it called the prettiest town in Dixie? <laughs> well, it is a historical town. Um, it's been dubbed the prettiest town in Dixie, certainly not by the people who are actually from there, but the people that, you know, moved themselves in and, you know, got to enjoy the land these last couple of hundred years. Um, but, yeah, we had to kind of restructure things because we have um, some work with uh, as Dr. Fontaine said, American Indian Political Party. And uh, the first candidate that we're actually working f- with is Noreen DeBlanc, and she's out of District 7, um, council, uh, parish council woman for Louisiana in St. Tammany's Parish. So we are looking forward to that. She will be the first American Indian woman of color in that seat in the state of Louisiana, if I'm not mistaken. So okay. we're looking nice. forward to that. So we kind of had to pivot from the event. And we're going back to the original formula. No grandma killers. We've been out for years. Um, and we did the touring uh, back since 2018. Um, and we actually 
work through the pandemic as best as we could. Uh, when Atlanta was, Georgia was the first state that opened up and that's where we had kicked the tour off before. We had people coming from all over the country with their families, from great grandmother down to the great granddaughters, you know, driving from Arizona to Georgia. Like we had a really great turnout and it's consistent. The same people, they'll show up to one event, they'll come wherever we are. Great, thank you so much. And I'm gonna actually go back to ask me about this no grandma kill it but i'll get back to that in a second my second question was that the last time you guys were here on the show dr fontaine you discussed a petition regarding the classification of american indians under the american inclusion act or regarding this american inclusion act but i might be i might be a little bit off but you can correct me um not one signer mentioned that their family mentioned their family being misclassified as colored resulting in a loss of identity and according to according to the signer on the on the change website, she says, or I don't know if it's a he or she, but the, the, it was the comment is, and I quote, "I'm signing because I have documents stating my family are Chitimacha. My family was misclassified as colored, and now my kids and family don't know who they are. Now, could you provide us with an update on the petition and the progress you're making?" And if you have any insight on this particular story mentioned by this person who is indicating why she she or he is, is signing. Absolutely. Uh, to give a uh, real-time update of the petition, um, our current metrics of the petition are 8521, so 8,521 signatures. Um, our next milestone that we are aiming for is yes. 10,000 signatures. Yes. Um, so we are less than 1,500 away from that goal. So, um, you know, for all the listeners uh, of the Neoliberal Round, Neoliberal Podcast, we're asking if you could please um, sign, read, and, of course, share um, amongst all your networks uh, regarding uh, the individual who – expressed that their Chitty Macha lineage and that um, their progeny and their their children or grandchildren have been um, misclassified uh, through the use of what I call MBC, Negro, Black, or Color. Um, <laughs> Wait, say this again. MBC um, is what? <laughs> yes, Negro, Black, or Color, okay. um, as well as Mulatto is a designation mm-hmm. um, yeah. that some American Indians use. But with that, right, um, that individual definitely seems as though that they know um, not only their racial or, or national identity, which is American Indian, but also their ethnicity, which would be their respective tribal lineage, which in that case would be Chirimacha. Um, yeah. So those types of um, occurrences and omissions have definitely created um, an interesting kettle of fish for folks who are American Indian and have been misclassified through the use of different government instruments, whether that be the census, whether that be military records, whether that be um, death certificates or birth certificates. Those are all ways that uh, institutional misclassification um, happen a lot of times to American Indians. I did want to pivot real quick regarding the petition to highlight some of our um, rather VIP um, names. Yes, uh, I was going to ask you because I think she, um, Chief Heller, formerly Kyrie Irving, she, uh, mm-hmm. he has he he he's supporting the Urban Indian Heritage Society, and there might be others who have even changed their names. Tell me about that a little bit. Absolutely. Uh, not only has um, Chief Hella. Um, also known as uh, Kyrie Irving, um, has not only uh, shared it once, but he has re, well, I don't think it's retweeted, but reshared it twice on the X, formerly known as Twitter platform. Yes. Um, we also, you know, I would also like to highlight, highlight uh, Mr. Hawthorne James, if folks uh, are familiar with the movie The Five Heartbeats. Uh, Big Red Davis, uh, also known as Hawthorne James, uh, was a supporter of the petition. Um, And also a few months ago, uh, former presidential candidate 
uh, Dr. Cynthia A. McKinney also supported the petition um, by not only uh, resharing via X, but also signing it. Uh, oh, so nice. we have a lot of, yes, we have a lot of um, support um, within multiple realms, whether you're talking politics, sports, entertainment, mm -hmm. and over the next few weeks, um, as we near our 10K mark, you know, we feel as though that it's only going to gravitate more attention um, from those VIP individuals. And what's the um, probably Phoenix could step in? What's the ultimate goal again of this petition? Where, where are you taking it? What's going to happen after you have gotten all your all the votes that you need? What happens next? Well, we call yeah. it we like to call it straightening. Right. Where we have this conversation with Congress and we finally get to shoot our shot so to speak, yeah. right? We, people haven't spoken about this and we haven't had representation. Um, we know it's not, um, I, I won't say it's not a lot of us, but it's plenty of us. And as people are coming into more information regarding their family, the, it's going to just grow from there because it's about the families. Um, I'm not the only Indian in my family. So when we created the petition, I have 200 first cousins, 200 of my people signed that petition. My parents signed a petition, right? So these are, that's the, that's the basis of uh, the conversation that we need to have in front of Congress. We have a list of grievances, things that uh, would require them to uh, at least hear about us um, seeking restitution um, for some of these things that have occurred. And definitely we want to make sure that it's acknowledged in law what's actually happened um, over the course of these years, uh, specifically since 1968, um, that we don't even have to go back so far. 1968, Public Law 90284 uh, was introduced uh, via the civil rights movement, but the actual act itself encompasses rights of Indians. That's who Martin Luther King was. That's who Coretta Scott was. That's who Jesse Jackson is. That's who Al Sharpton is, even though they don't admit to it. That's a title and a different dual citizenship that they have within the Cherokee Nation that they don't speak about. Mm. And um, just Absolutely. so you know, we are live on Facebook. And for those of us who are joining us on Facebook, this is part two. Of, an, of the interview with the members of the Urban Indian Heritage Society, Dr. Nolan Fontaine, and of course, Miss Phoenix Moon. And they're talking about um, the Urban Indian Heritage Society, their challenges, their successes, and providing an education and awareness around this misclassification and the importance of reclaiming heritage and the, and the conversation that we need to have in order for this reclaim. back on sorry about that are we back on guys yes yes i can hear you now i can hear you sorry about that guys my fault listen i have the urban Indian heritage society with me for part two of the nearly we on podcast you're talking about the urban Indian heritage society and we just we just lost you guys because my phone died sorry my laptop died i apologize about that but we are back we're still recording. I think we are still live streaming because you guys were still on. So that's great. I like the technology. <laughs> we didn't lose you guys. We're still on Facebook. But um, Phoenix was ta talking. I had asked the question about um, the, 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 the inclusion. Sorry. The, um, I, I, I'd asked a question about the petition that they have. And so you, I didn't know when you finished talking about this misclassification and some people who are, who are classified as colored, but they're not. And you were talking about civil rights activists like Jesse Jackson and so on and so forth, who are not talking about this particular issue. You can, you can um, finish up, um, Phoenix, if you would like. Yes, just a lot of different caveats that they've kept to themselves. Uh, Maxine Waters also, she is Cherokee uh, by blood and she is a card carrying member. So not only is she a, a citizen of the United States, she's also a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. So okay. the, a lot of the history, I'm sure she's familiar with, but her advocacy is not for Indians. It's for black people. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Oh, this is quite interesting. This is quite interesting. And I have to, and we'll follow up with that question some more. Um, the next question is for, um, for um, Phoenix. You mentioned 
you mentioned the connection between the American Indian Civil Rights Movement and the hippie movement during the 1960s, Summer of Love. Um, and in fact, I was reading where you said that this is, this is who helped hijack American Indian civil rights. And for those of us who are watching, you can go visit Phoenix Moon's page and she shows the Indian sign with that red backdrop and so on. You said, this is who helped hijack American Indian civil rights. Hijack. Oh. So your, your claim is that Americans, and you just mentioned the facts about civil rights leaders who are not um, fight, who are not talking about the Indian aspect or the American aspect of this urban Indian her or the, the heritage or the right for fight for civil rights. And you said, and you said in a tweet recently, this is who helped hijack American Indian civil rights. And you put I A I A I M hippies at the summer love in 1960s. Could you elaborate on this connection and its significance? Yes. Well, Louisiana um, has become what we we call it the hand in the cookie jar. So as we are making our claims, we have found so many discrepancies in the law in Louisiana and how they've recognized federal, uh, federally and state recognized Indians for the last, I'd say, 60, 70 years. Yes. Um, and what I when I was uh, saying, claiming that aim, the American Indian movement, it started after the Civil Rights Act, after the death of Martin Luther King. So they weren't advocating prior to that, right? That's not their thing. In the United mm -hmm. States, we have single subject law, single yeah. subject matter. So if we are creating a bill to save the dolphins and the bill yeah. actually becomes an act into law, we cannot at the last minute say, wait, can we save the manatees too? That law <laughs> is specific to the dolphins and it doesn't cover the manatees. You would have to have a different process and go through the introduction of the bill all over again in order to save the manatees. So in the interest of the Civil Rights Act, it says rights of Indians. And when it lists all of the things um, that are there, they don't apply to Native Americans. They did not leave a reservation and had a problem getting a hamburger in Woolworths. Yeah. They're not the people that had a hard time getting a hotel room in the 60s. They're not the people that walked into banks and couldn't get a loan and were redlined repeatedly. So who you call it the Fair Housing Act? They have all of these different nicknames for it. Yes, yes. Single subject matter. It is rights of Indians. So AIM, when I talk about the summer of love, uh, you have the hotbed of, of, of corruption in this country. A lot of it, the majority of it takes place in Louisiana, historically and currently. Um, now, with that, they're these group of children, descendants of slave owners and Confederates, their children meet up in the 60s um, and they get groups of people from California, New York, Louisiana, um, Chicago, Ohio, and they head out to Hate Nashbury in California um, and they have the Summer of Love, which sparks the hippie movement. So when I show the symbol of the, the AIM symbol, which is their logo, it's showing you the peace sign, yeah. right? And the two fingers yes. that are in the shape of, a, of what people would view as an Indian, ah, right? Yeah. So during this same time, you have Crying Eyes Cody, who's an Italian man. If you remember the Keep America Clean commercials that we used to see uh, back yeah. in the days with the crying Indian, that man is a mascot. He became the face of what people believe the Indian is. Yet they're now Native Americans. They're no longer Indians anymore. They're Native Americans. That's a new people. And those are um, two different designations. To, correct. And, and, we've and been I think I'm going to ask a question about that in a few minutes, too, about this, the difference between this Native American and, and actually there's a group that's changing their names. But I don't want to preempt myself. I'm going to ask you about a little bit about this Native American ideology. But that I guess that stems, that particular um, tweet that you provided stems from the conversation surrounding the indigenous and the native and so on. That's correct. And what the difference oh is, um, and then again, there, I'm always making, um, you know, uh, creating the, the, the conversation with, I have these questions that have never been asked, right, yeah. openly. And I know it's going to be difficult for the people that have been perpetuating the lie to answer correctly. Yeah. They're looking for us to accept these blanket statements. Um, but be, being that we're able to individualize ourselves and compartmentalize this information and apply it to ourselves and our families throughout history, 
it's harder for them to be able to lie. Yes. Oh, wow. This so is, this now is, this you have is, a lot of people yes. that are Native Americans and they were white people. They were slave owners. They were Creoles. They were not Indians ever until now. And they had to use the strangest part is that they use these slave names that they said that they gave to us in order to claim being indigenous in the first place. Ah, uh, okay. So, so there's those, there's some people who claim it native Americans as against indigenous mean you're talking about the original people that were here, the ancient, ancient Americans. The ancient ones. That's correct. And Native American, um, it means something by law now. And what it means is federally recognized tribe, right? That's pretty much what it is. Prior to that, it always meant someone born here. Right. Yes. So your parents both can be from China. If the baby is born here, that baby would be a Native American. OK, OK. Ah, that is that's powerful. That's thank but you for not that. but not every Native American is an American Indian. Yes. Yes. Ah, OK. I understand what you mean. Not every say it again for, the, for our viewers. And listeners. not every Native American is an American Indian. OK, that's that's powerful. And um, I think I understand it. Not every native is an Indian because you can claim native, but you're not necessarily part of the ancient history and the, and so I understand what you're saying. Now, by the way, I have a question for Dr. Fontaine. Well, Dr. Fontaine, you and Phoenix highlighted the idea that we all share the same number of grandparents and we are continuing the conversation. We all share the same number of grandparents and that right. progress is a collective effort. Now, we all have the same amount of grandparents based on, um, based on the tweet. Uh, it took the same amount of give me that goddess here. Give me that goddess here. That's from Phoenix, of course. Again, we all have the same amount of grandparents. It took the same amount of give me that goddess here. No. Um, and then you went on to say, why my grandma got to die again? So your lie can live. And you talked about lie. Could, now, could you, ex both of you probably could expand on this concept and its implication about this, um, give me that goddess hair and um, and this whole why my grandmother gotta die again so your can live and can um, so your lie can live. Um, give me a little, tell me a little bit about that. Well, when I when I made that comment, I'm I'm speaking from a place of trying to express how small of a space for the ancient American has in their own land. So when I say my grandmother has to die again, meaning that people will kill your history to go for something that they believe may be true. So my grandmother dying again, she dies every day. Someone groups me in with a group of people and puts me under a blanket story um, yeah, without any yeah, accuracy, yeah, yeah. without any details in between. You know, we were just all one big slave. Everybody came from Africa. You're killing my family. You're killing my yes. heritage. Yeah. And in the interest, if you're not certain exactly who you are, you're stealing from somebody else to substitute for what you don't know about your own family. Yes. Yeah. This is your mom. Um, uh, Dr. Nolan, do you want to add to that? Absolutely. And I think that's really where, like, the essence of no grandmom killers, the, no, the phrase no grandmom killers came from, is because a lot of times you will have folks that will buy a lock, stock, and barrel into the ideological hegemony to use um, Gramsci, right? You'll have folks that will buy into the ideological hegemony of mass media, social media, and Hollywood, where folks will um, folks will ingest images of like Iron Eyes Cody, right, and yeah. really, re really uh, digest that versus holding on to the real um, oral narratives, family traditions, um, and other sacred texts within our own lineage that our grandparents have taught us. Yes. And that's one common denominator amongst all of us within urban Indian heritage society is that over time, we have been indoctrinated, not just by uh, mass media, and social media and cinema, but also a lot of times by the texts that we read and not just on the secondary level, also on the post-secondary and post-baccalaureate level. Yeah. This indoctrinization 
and this false narrative um happened to where folks want you to buy into th- this narrative that everyone was a slave. It yeah. took me having to go back and find too through my own individual paternal and maternal side to only realize that I only had three individuals in my entire family tree that I found thus far that were indentured servants. And I had one aunt that was listed actually as a slave, but yes. it actually worked out for her in the end because her husband passed and she inherited a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of land down south. So That's quite had, interesting. I, had I not done that deep diving research and forensic genealogy, right? I could have found myself still buying into, you know, a false narrative saying that all of my family was brought here via a transatlantic slave trade, which we're not saying did not happen. We're not saying it did not happen, but specifically for us as American Indians, you know, we have to take into account that the inter-American slave trade was just as brutal and just as heinous. Yes, it's just quite powerful. And thank you for making that clarification towards the end. And, um, and you know, actually, I teach a class, Jamaica Theological Seminary. I mean, I, I ended the semester teaching Caribbean thought. You guys visited Car- the, the, uh, one of the classes and shared, and we appreciate that. And in, after, we actually, based on, the, based on my research, my conversation with you guys, the Urban Indian Heritage Society and so on, I actually adjusted my, my Caribbean thought syllabus at Jamaica Theological Seminary to have a conversation about heritage and to revisit heritage in the issue of identity. We're looking at some of the books that we have. So for example, Arawaks to Africans, we started questioning those books, questioning the writers and those histories. Because many of those histories we took for granted, you know, they, we took for granted and we just inherited it. So, oh, the Arawaks all died out. Oh, there was a genocide. Um, but now we're questioning that. But we did a whole I asked them to trace their heritage and I was just marking their, their papers. A couple of days ago, I started marking and I was reading the papers and I, I, may, I noticed something, Phoenix and Dr. Fontaine. As I was reading the papers, asking them to trace their heritage, their roots, how far, I asked the question, how far back can you go? Talk with your parents, talk with your grandparents. Don't just rely on the books that's available. Talk with your own family. Um, do a research to find out your, your, how far back do you go. Don't take things for granted. Right. But so when they did project, um, return the homework, as I read, my, I'm a, almost every single one of my students could not, tra- there is, could not trace their, their lineage all the way back to their great, great, great grandparents. There's, there is some disruption somewhere on the maternal or the paternal side. You, you know, um, the students, I keep, the, the, the singular refrain was, there's not enough information. We don't know enough. I don't know enough. There's not enough. After my grandparents, I don't know enough. After my grandparents, I don't know what happened on the maternal side. The only side that there is enough on is probably, or if there is a maroonage side, there's still not enough and the connections there. And I, you know, and so it's quite interesting that as you, you notice this thread where, if you ask some other people about their lineage, they can talk about it beyond their great parents. But when you ask some people in the Caribbean and people of American or African American in lineage or whatever the case might be, there is always a problem. Why, why do you think that? Do you think that's that's part of what you guys are about in terms of reclaiming that what is lost, what is broken, and that's as a result of this strategy to to blur out lines. Phoenix or Dr. Fontaine? Well, I think also what's important is where are you looking exactly, right? You know that they existed. There's a birth certificate for you. There's one for your parents. There's going to be marriage certificates, death certificates. Where are people buried at? Sometimes it's not so um, up front. There might be a whole cemetery that has all of your ancestors in it, all of your recent in the last 200, 300 years buried in there that people don't know. Things happen. People migrated. They got disconnected. But I would say expand the search when you realize what the history is. So I'll just take Jamaica, for example. Jamaica has been through Spanish, British, uh, Spanish, I think maybe even French for a minute um, for a short, brief time. 
back to Spain, uh, uh, British, back to Spain, back to Britain, right? Um, so those histories are going to be housed in different areas. So when it was the Spanish colony, it's going to be housed in um, in the Spanish records. And when it's the British, when they were under British occupation, most of those records are going to be in the British repository. I would not think that um, now, although I have done a lot of Jamaican genealogy, but I also know what it is that I'm looking for. The Catholic Church was there as well. You have Spanish yeah. town. The, you have all of these indicators, right, that'll let you know who was there prior. A lot of these names change. You have unincorporated towns that could have been the bustling Tulsa, Oklahoma of Kingston. You know, you can have certain sections that could have been completely different from what they are now. Right. Yeah. Maybe they're poverty now, but they may have been the richest part of the land at another point in time. So right. it's important to know where you're looking. It's not just going to be census records, which is mostly what we have here in, in stateside. Right. But yeah. there's also going to be census records there. Um, there's going to be you have your royal plantations and you have your uh, settler plantations. Um, yeah. There's different military things for the men. Always look at the military records. One of the most fascinating things of, uh, historically that are easy to get to are the records for the military. Jamaican regiment has been yeah. all over the world and they have probably one of the longest standing armies that I've seen recorded. Um, I'm talking pre-revolutionary war up until now. Yes, yes. So there is going to be a good documentation, a bit of documentation that gives you clues. If there were migrations, of course, some people left and moved to uh, Europe in the 1930s and 40s. Right. Um, yes. So those records are going to be housed there. Also, there's collateral lines. So we look for generally the direct grandparents. Right. My mother, yes. my mother's parents, my mother's parents, parents and so on and so forth. Um, also, which is important, are the collateral lines, my mother's siblings. So for the documents that I may not be able to find uh, yeah. for my grandparents, I can find something that my grandfather's brother is on. Right. right. Um, yeah. So those those are also clues. And it's not something that you can have overnight. You're going to do overnight. I've been doing this since I was 12. I'll be 50 next year. I've been doing it before the ease of ancestry when we had to get microfilms and, you know, the old itchy paper with the fleas and stuff, you know, white gloves. <laughs> they didn't have a lot of access. So, right, um, yeah. and then there's, you have to find out the time frame for when they release records or when they'll be uploaded. Um, yeah. And it may take some sleuthing. You might have to go to the parish. You might have to go and look at the Catholic church records. Look at the yeah. schools that were there. Um, look at some of those things are going to be big indicators. There are certain hospitals or certain places, things, events that took place where only um, specific people were. You know, um, the maroon history is very deep um, and it is documented. And you yeah. don't have you have more than one type of maroon. You have the maroons in Panama and along the northern coast yeah. of South America as well. Right. Yeah, that is true. By the way, Phoenix, you mentioned um, you've emphasized the distinction between being indigenous, and we met, we talked about that for a little bit earlier. Um, the distinction between indigenous and being a native, and you tweeted, "Sheesh, we got to be careful saying indigenous because that means you came without or with nothing. You came with nothing." My look folks, at the root word, indigene. Yes. Ah, yes, yes, and you talked about the all a lot of them came indigena in old English law, and you say that a subject born, one born within the realm or naturalized by an act of parliament, and you reference that. In fact, you retweeted a story being saying, you retweeted a story saying, and I quote, no sooner than, you said, oh, you said, no sooner than I said this, no sooner than I said this, there is a story in Atlanta that talks about the Native American Journalists Association is aiming to become more inclusive as its members vote on whether to rebrand as the Indigenous Journalist Association, for persons who don't know about what's going on with this in Atlanta, the Native American Journalist Association is aiming to become more inclusive at, as its members vote on whether to rebrand as the Indigenous Journalist Association. A move inspired, listen to the inspiration, a move inspired in part by evolving trends in cultural identity. And I don't know if 
Phoenix Moon and the UIHS is part of that because they've been talking about this. And here we have this group now changing their name. Now the group with more than 950 members, mostly in the US, is expected to approve the change at its annual conference this week in Winnipeg, Canada, voting on the name as well as branding that would replace a feather with an with, with some other logo um, and so on and so forth. But um and so the, the, the NAJA wants to foster inclusion with indigenous journalists there as well in Alaska and Hawaii, since Native American is a modern alternative for American Indians. So the story goes on and on and on. So could you Dev, give us a little bit deeper into the distinction and its importance in today's context? And um, what do you think about what's going on with the American Journalists Association, Native American Journalists Association changing their name? I like to push back real quick before Phoenix uh, jumps in and yes. uh, on a statement that Native American is a modern alternative for American Indian, Indian. Those are two diametrically different uh, taxonomies. Okay. Right. And for them to say that and to be considered journalists, I I, I would want to speak with their president. Uh, vis a vis, face to face, to get an understanding of how they came to this place in space. I understand that uh, they may have um, colleagues, as you said, their their annual conference will be held in Canada. So I'm I'm very aware of uh, the different um, classifications, um, terminology, and taxonomies that folks in Canada you know, identify themselves as, whether that be First Nation, whether that be Aboriginal, or whether that be Indigenous. And at the same time, uh, if we're staying true to our, our, our identity here in America, um, and if they are primarily made up of Native Americans, not American Indians, I think they should, I think it would be good if they just kept that and, and stayed true to it versus changing it for the sake of I think you said uh, changing cultural trends. Yes, cultural trends in terms of the, as it relates to cultural identity. So I guess they're, ah. they're yes broadening their term, but um yes so I, so that's quite yeah. We I would love to also we're going to reach out to the NJ NAJA see if anyone can come on and speak with us here at the Near Liberal, find out about this Ab and post the absolutely. question that you have. Yes. Yeah, we we it's love it. to we love to sit back on with them uh, face to face if you could set that up. Go ahead, Phoenix. Yeah, definitely. Phoenix, yes. Well, I, I'm just going to say there may be some some things. That, there's absolutely a discussion that could be had. Um, but I I know for sure it's okay for the, to say indigenous, right? Even though it's kind of like that word is still kind of being taken away right now, right? So one thing that they're not going to be able to take away is ancient. Okay, okay. Right. It used to be yeah. Aboriginal, but now Aboriginal is applied to specifically Pacific Islanders, New Zealand. Right. Um, uh, there's also this instance with the misclassified Hawaiians. They're native Hawaiians. They're not the real Hawaiians anymore. Oh. They're not the people that were related to to, to Kalani. Right. Yeah. Are they her kinfolk? Those people would have been, you know, had that relativity. So now the same thing that's happened to us has happened in um, Hawaii as well, right? Now they have the native Hawaiian where people from all over the world can be a native Hawaiian. Yes. Right. Doesn't Which mean that they're related have... to the people yep. that are of the land, right? That's that was, that's what you call just uh, uh, sole rather than just consanguinous, right? Just sanguinous, yes. which is by the blood and then there's by the land. Right, right. Thank you so much. And you are saying something, um, Dr. Fontaine? No, I was just going to piggyback and saying, um, and that's where you get um, pictorial images in folks' head where they associate with these specific uh, land masses. When you think of Native Hawaiian now, most people think of folks like, unfortunately, um, President Barack Obama or Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard. Um, you know, versus, you know, the original royal family, um, such as King Kamehameha or Queen Leopulani, right? Um, yes, before yes. They, their, their kingdom 
was overthrown by the United States Corporation and, and the Dole Company, yeah. right? So th these are very, um, these are very insidious games that are being played with words and terminology that are still happening in real time. Yes. And by the way, Dr. Fontaine, shifting gears a little bit since we have you on the floor, um, you engage with a tweet and discussion about Brian Babin or ba Brian Babin from Texas. Um, he's sponsoring a bill to prevent the U.S. from supporting reparations. For those of us who are not aware, um, Brian Babin from Texas is sponsoring a bill to prevent the United States from supporting reparations. And um, um, and, by, and there is a story in First Tribe entitled African Lineage DNA, African li Lineage DNA, um, African Lineage DNA to American already tried for reparations cases thrown out as not valid enough. Um, that is pinned on the UIHS Twitter page. Again, the story is written in First Tribe entitled African Lineage DNA to American already tried for reparations cases thrown out as not valid enough, which is pinned on the UIHS Twitter page. And according to the article, when the topic of lineage is brought up to common tactics, is brought up about African DNA. What's not mentioned at all is African DNA to the Americas, African um, DNA to the Americas, which has already been disregarded as insufficient. And um, so, and of course, the article goes on to say that in 2002, descendants of African slaves filed a historic class action lawsuit in US federal court demanding reparations from financial, so on and so forth. So the question for you guys is, um, um, and for Dr. Fontaine, can you provide us with some insights on this matter as, as it relates to its potential impact and, um, and what the, UI, the UIHS is talking, has been um, talking about as it relates to this classification and reclassification? Right. Um, we like to shout out our partner and organization, our partner and colleagues at First Tribe Nation. Uh, yes. for all the hard work and research that they provide. Uh, so shout out to First Tribe Nation, uh, particularly about um, the reparations bill or the um, that was proposed. Um, one thing that stuck up, stuck out for me in that is um, the reason why I feel that the Texas representative proposed that is Texas is a republic um um state um yes. not in terms of being republican but it is known as a republic um yes. meaning that you know they they have representation that is voted for by the people um and states should be able to operate how you know the people choose um so if for instance gavin newsom in the state of california would like to issue representation uh, reparations for individuals who have presented, you know, just cause in terms yes. of being uh, quote unquote enslaved, then if the people um, empowered, you know, decide that and choose to have their elected representatives uh, push that legislation, then, okay. you know, so be it. Um, and at the same time, if a specific state cannot balance their budget, right, then that that should not fall on the federal government. I, I, I felt as though that was the spirit of that bill, because let's say, for instance, California does move forward with reparations, and, you know, let's say that they go bankrupt for it. The federal government should not have to come in and scoop or bail them out because of their financial mismanagement, yeah, right? Yeah. It's, it's simple accounting here, right? So it's not to say that, you know, we're necessarily against reparation, we're not. Um, in terms of us within UIHS, of course, we believe in restitution. Um, yes. That, that is what we uh, stake our claim, stake our flag on. Um, but the, the, the caveat that we always uh, present to folks that are looking for reparations claims is one to specifically continue to do your genealogy because genealogy is a, is a lifelong work. 
too, yes. to continue to have these conversations with your family to see, you know, if this is something that everyone within the family wants, right? Yeah. And then three, to, to look at, you know, the stipulations of what the respective state is asking for, if that's something that you want to move forward with. Again, once again, in UIHS, we specifically rally around um, the, the term of restitution, which is something that we can specifically can pinpoint to a specific entity, organization, or institution that has brought harm towards our family. And we are asking for just compensation uh, yes. for, for those harms done to us. But the, uh, so, sorry, the conversation you are having, and by the way, um, the conversation you are having as it relates to the restitution, I know um, the first African tribe, I think part of the question was, why do you think that the connections with African to American ancestry is not included in the whole discussion, in terms of these discussions, um, as it relates to reparation, or is it included? The, the African to the American ancestry, is it going to create... Um, is it going to create further problems for people? Um, why do you think this is not included? Well, honestly, because, I think we have to talk. Oh, go ahead, Fanny. Well, I would say um, Africa already apologized and had talks about reparations for their role in the transatlantic slave trade um, as early as 2013 okay. that I know of. Um, several countries since then have come out and, um, you know, apologized and they have offered refer reparations packages or made themselves, let me say this, they've made themselves available to talk. But as it stands, people are only concerned with being a slave here in America, mm -hmm. not how they got here. They're okay. only fascinated with the idea of being transported from Africa oh. with no culpability from the, the, the kingdoms over there that were actually the primary slave sellers there, right? So a perfect, the movie Woman King, not only was it, um, it, it was well written, but it's a true story, right? Um, but it was, it showed something very specific and I actually absolutely love this movie. Um, and it it's the end of the Dahomey slave trade. Right. Yes. But it also shows that you have the Oyo, the Hausa and the Igbo people that combined together and joined the Confederacy to perpetuate the slave trade as the Dahomey are trying to separate themselves from it. Right. Okay. So okay. now these, of course, the Dahomey, they're now in different corporate states. Right. Because there, there's no state called Dahomey, but there's places where we know that they um, have been settled for years and where these things took place. So with that being said, these countries, Benin, Ivory Coast, um, uh, uh, Ghana, Nigeria, uh, these other countries, uh, I'm, I'm imagining South Africa would be in there somewhere soon because their slavery just ended in 1994, right? So yeah. they, they, they've got some catching up to do, but at the same time, People have grievances. Again, if people are not certain of how they got here, that kind of hurts their story here in America for reparations because they need to have the details. If they ask you to prove that you are an African slave, are people going to be able to do it? I think that is important. And you can't say that there are no records because there's no uh, car dealer that doesn't know how many cars he has in his inventory. Doesn't uh, make any sense. Okay, thank you guys. I like it. I like yes, to take you back real you. quick before we go to the next question, but yeah. I like to bring us to um, an article from last year of September of 2022 that's yeah. published by communityvoiceks.com, which is a online um, community organ, um, a blog uh, for the Kansas City News, and one of the articles that it referenced is KC Kansas City hosts Ghana delegation for enslavement apology. Oh. And I'll read the, the first paragraph and yeah, then do, yes. I'll connect it. It says, Kansas City will play host to a delegation from Ghana on a pilgrimage to the site of the Quindaro Underground Railroad to apologize for their involvement in the transatlantic slave trade, but also to begin a new and long lasting relationship. Now, to piggyback off what Phoenix said in, regard, in regards to reparations, if individuals 
can make the claim that they are, uh, that they were enslaved via the transatlantic slave trade, then why not take your reparations claim to the entity such as Ghana, who has taken full responsibility for their part in the transatlantic slave trade? Yes, yes. Oh, right? Yeah. Not the United States, <laughs> right? Yeah. Why not take your claim to Ghana? Why not take your claim to Benin? Why not take your claim to former Gold Coast? Yes. Right. And they're also like Georgetown University just also made an announcement that it got rich off the rich off the backs of of slaves and so on, and they are probably taking responsibility. Um, so even oh, their we, private interests oh. who are coming on saying, okay, I'm we are responsible. This is what we're doing to give back. Oh, absolutely. And not to mention the Jesuit influence that represents Georgetown, but UIHS has been all over that because. Many of yeah. us American Indians also have genealogical ties um, to that area of DC, former Virginia, former Maryland, right? Um, yeah. Which is all considered the Tidewater region. Um, so we, we've definitely been in uh, the nooks and crannies of that, of those documents that have begun to surface at Georgetown as well. Um, but yeah. the last thing I'll end on is regarding the reparations claim. Um, I think folks also have to consider individuals like uh, the pop star Grimes or Elon Musk yeah. or Charlize Theron, all of whom are considered African-American, right? Aren't, if they can prove that their ancestors have been enslaved, wouldn't that be right for them to get a part of the reparation. Uh, that's a good and one. That, yeah, that's just something for all of us to think about. That is true. That is good. That that's a good. That's a powerful point, and I think that's part of the issue as well. The whole hybrid hybridization of society, which helps to um, create problems in terms of. I'm I'm going to get to that part in a second. I want to ask Phoenix about. She brought up the term. Phoenix had brought up the term denizen or. It resembles citizen, but denizen, and its and um and its legal implications. Um, could you shed some light on what this term means and why it's relevant to the discussions about indigenous rights and natural phoenix? Are you there? Um, yes, I'm sorry, my sound had went out. A denizen <laughs> uh, is a serf, um. And that, of course, it goes back to feudal law, if people are familiar with feudal law. Uh, Denison is a serf, not necessarily a citizen. They are definitely subject. Um, generally, uh, denizens were indentures, right? Um, okay. And they still would have had to have been naturalized in order to be uh, have the privilege or benefits of being a citizen of whatever. Before the United States was formed, it would be the Virginia colony, a citizen of the Plymouth colony, under the subject of the British crown or whatever crown. If it was in Florida, it would have been Spanish, right? Okay. Um, I definitely wanted to mention that. But going back yeah. to uh, being careful with the words, because Elon Musk, bringing up Elon Musk and Charlie Steron, the actual language, Afrikaans, it belongs to them. Yes. The very word African um, before the continent was called Africa directly relates to Europeans. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So now uh, at some point, if they're taking back all of these other words, right, they gave up Native uh, in, in Indian, American Indian here. Right. And we got hijacked and people are saying Native American. Now, they also yeah. did something very uh, specific in the last couple of years. They've changed the names of all the sports teams that had American Indian names, pictures, or the likenesses of dark Indians, right? Yeah. Uh, the Cleveland Indians, well, the, the commanders, they now want to go back to those names. But they don't want to put that dark skin Indian on there as the logo anymore. So you okay. see how they're playing games. They're just shifting back and forth. It's kind of like a trading places. Even yeah. the words black and white mean the exact same thing etymologically. They're opposites in the dictionary, opposites in our speech uh, when we think in, in terms of skin color and race, right? But at the same time, they both are proto-Germanic and they come from a specific area, the very 
uh, words themselves mean the exact same thing etymologically, and they are attached to Europeans who are now called Europeans. So if Scipio Africanus, those families are the progenitors of the original so-called Africans, then how do people relate back to them? Are people being honest in scope about their European ancestry? Because it's there. It would be there in order for you to exist in whatever race they made up or whatever thing, they moniker they want to give people these days. Oh, thank you. That's quite powerful. Any, any comments on the issue before I ask a final question from um, Dr. Fontaine? I have one final question. I guess it's a good fitting question, yeah. probably. I, I think Phoenix sum, summarized that effectively. Yes. Chef's kiss. <laughs> and, but, and that brings us to the next question because um, finally, for, and actually, it's, I have another question probably after this one because I want to talk about some of your challenges the issue with data breaches because i heard recently you guys had a major data breach at the at, at the society and um and the work that you guys do in terms of providing awareness and challenging the status quo in a sense um that exposes you to a lot of risk and threats and so on how are what are some of the challenges how are you able to overcome some of these challenges as you seek to bring about more awareness um as you as, and, and reclaiming heritage and identity But um, but maybe I shouldn't ask that. Yeah, go ahead. You uh, yeah, okay. We can ask that question. No, you know what? We could. I'll ask that question now. What are some of the challenges you guys are facing um, at the at the Urban Indian Heritage Society, and how are you able to overcome? Well, I think uh, at UIHS we we kind of begun to take on this this uh, not not just this phrase, but actually living it. We have a phrase. Um, kind of spearheaded by Phoenix, what we call chewing and walking bubble gum, and, <laughs> and you know, as as we as we get, you know, as we get various challenges, whether it be yeah. data breaches, um, whether it be, um, you know, uh, doxing or physical uh, attacks online and social media spaces, um, whether it be our affiliates, such as you at the neoliberal and other affiliates also being targeted. Yes, um, because yes, we of are. Affiliation with UIHS or um, just for your knowledge management. Um, these are all things that we try to be and that we strive, continue to strive to be transparent with our members about, but also looking at innovative 21st century uh, ways that our other partnering organizations and um, other institutions uh, that we admire, how they, you know, specifically um, take care of their knowledge management, whether that's looking at, you know, 21st century technology. Um, for instance, um, on your last neoliberal um, commentary, a podcast uh, with um, Dante, I know one of the things that you referenced were looking at a VPN or a VPS, yes. uh, virtual protocol server. And, you know, at UIHS, if we had never talked to you, you know, that in terms of a VP VPS, we probably wouldn't have considered those types of tools and technologies to yeah. help scaffold us just so, you know, we can be a little we can batten down the hatches a little bit more for when this ever happens. And I think that's one of the things is preparing um, in case this ever happens or in the words of Phoenix, um, staying ready so we ain't got to get ready. <laughs> um, so, you know, conversations and dialogues with yes. other partner organizations, whether it's you, uh, whether it's First Tribe Nation, um, whether it's our other partner and organization, um, Drop Squad Kitchen, um, or, you know, other American Indian headed um, yes. entities that we work with. I think just being real honest and transparent about what we're going through, you'll really notice that we have a lot more in common than we do, you know. Yes. Yeah, th th that th more true. than not. Yeah. <laughs> Phoenix, did you want to add? We're all that? about making popular what was the monopoly. <laughs> That's your tagline. Yes, I, I yes, yes. Just used to 
you know, um, the doc saying, you know, they had pictures of my sister that just fresh died. She wasn't dead four days from cancer. Like, like I've been through the doc saying, um, you know, pictures of my grandmother, all, yeah. all sorts of stuff. I've been through it. The death threats. Um, uh, I, I, I kind of just learned to roll with it. And I knew yeah. that it was a lot of. Um, you know, Bruce people, because, the, you know, the, the, here it is with this topic. And then the sources, right? I, I know that I take pride in the fact that we are sources. We are we are sorcerers. What I mean by that is not only do we make a claim, but we can effectively show you how to substantiate it with the sources, primary sources that are easily overlooked. Right. Um, yeah. And that's not to minimize the great works that other people have done. But when you're reading books like, let's say, When Rocks Cry Out, did you source his sources? Where is he getting these sources from? Yeah. Right. Bibliography. All of those things are important. Right. Um, and a lot of that gets left out. So it gets left up to speculation. And there's no way that someone that doesn't mention myself or my grandmother or my family, what can they accurately say in regards to them? So what it is, is we're getting some stories. Yes. We're getting stories, but is it your story? Oh. I think that's important for everybody, irrespective uh, if they are Indian or not. You that owe it true. to your family to know this information. You owe it to yourself to have your history so that people do not have the option to lie about you or yours. Oh, wow. I love this because yeah, and that's a strategy to redefine you in order to take claim of you, ownership of you. And, um, and so the effort is working against that. And, um, and that my finally for both of you is the concept of race, um, as a, the concept of race as a human creation, which is, which I've oftentimes said is created or designed to divide and conquer. Um, what are your thoughts on this notion in terms of how does it influence our understanding of identity and societal dynamics? Which is the last question, if you guys want to take it up. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Nola. Could you repeat that question one more time, Nola? Yes, yeah, so, you know, I've oftentimes talked about the issue of race being a human cre uh, a creation designed to divide and conquer. Just um, and then um, which was which which persons had found useful in the 1600s to to justify why they are going to enslave a whole set of people and start this the slave trade and so on and so forth. Um, does that how does that now, I have oftentimes said that that's not a negation against what UIHS is doing, because there are people who would think that it's a negation. It's challenging what this claim about identity. But what, what I've said is that people, people in all, people didn't really think of themselves in any particular race per se, with, and any particular race with certain privileges until it became useful for people to do so in the 1600s. Any, any thoughts about um, this particular idea or this theory, I, I mean, this, this issue of race, whether or not it existed and so on and so forth. And how does that speak to the dynamics or to what you are doing? I think you're on mute. Thank you. Yes. From my understanding, my socio-historical understanding and lens, I was always I had the understanding that when you think of the term is uh, physiognomy, yes. uh, P-H-Y-S-I-O-G-N-O-M-Y, which was um, determining um, one's trustfulness based yeah. on their facial features, their countenance, their expression, but also specifically on their respective hue of their skin. And this was done in um, Eurasia, Ottoman Empire, North Africa, that region, pre-1400s. Then the understanding that uh, anthropologist Blumenbach, you know, developed these racial classifications, right, around the same time that, you know, Carl Linnaeus came up with the different kingdoms uh, and um, genus and species, right? To substantiate this whole notion of um, a quote unquote uh, racial classification. Yes. So 
now having that understanding and looking at the work that we do with UIHS, uh, at times I, I will say it, it can be challenging having that understanding and now having to put on, you know, having to put on the glasses of looking at it specifically from the American Indian perspective, because now not only do we see that, you know, a lot of this was done um, to crystallize, you know, certain aspects of, you know, commerce and the slave trade, but also yeah. in, ter in terms of um, the biggest thing, which was land dispossession and internal displacement. Yes. Yeah. Right, the recreation of borders and um, territories and confederation. So when when I look at that, th those are kind of the things that pop up for me when I when I think about um, American Indians and this whole racial classification um, umbrella. But also, you know, going back to the point regarding, you know these new terms of classification, whether that be indigenous, whether that be Native American, or another one that's very near and dear to us at UIHS is the term BIPOC, which stands for What's Black- it again? BIPOC, which stands yeah. for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, which yes. has become this catch-all umbrella term that once again, you know, puts individual who, cl who classify themselves as black or African-American, indigenous, yeah. Native American, um, American Indian, and any other person that has melanin, which is another form of erasure, Yeah. right? So not, not only are we working in the past, but <laughs> we're also working in the present and the future. Yes. So it's very yeah. dynamic in, in terms of how you know past conceptualizations of race you know how we have to have that understanding right to even you know grapple with the current you know taxation uh, excuse me taxonomy and um understanding of racial classification now and specifically when it comes to american indian i hope that answered your question sure sure Definitely, definitely. And um, and I don't know if Phoenix had any, I think had wanted to add to this, I'd be wrap up. Um, but my next question would be what, as we wrap up this particular, ep this episode, because we're going to have some more episodes talking about what's going on with the UIHS. What is the next step for you, for you, for the Urban Indian Heritage Society? Um, what, are, what, are, what What's the next big project for you guys? And what, what's the next big step for you guys at UIHS? As we, as we wrap up this show, um, who wants to go? Uh, well, next up, again, we're segueing into uh, working in conjunction with the American Indian Political Party. Um, I personally will be um, doing whatever I can to assist with the campaign efforts for uh, Ms. Noreen LeBlanc, which would be the first. Again, we're looking to have her be the first uh, American Indian woman of color, period, um, in St. Tammany's Parish on the council. Um, oh. making these decisions. A lot of historical uh, trails that are there. There's big money over there by the waterways um, yes. and things yes. of that nature. Uh, so there's some things that have been going on, the nepotism and things, and we're looking to put a stop to that. She's going to be the voice of the voiceless. So I'll be, you know, uh, pretty submerged uh, with helping her campaign. Um, and, you know, simply keeping people up to date on some of the other candidates and, yes. you know, what they got going on. Very interesting things. And reason being, again, the federal recognition process um, was completely exposed and left open uh, with the state of Louisiana. And that's enough for us to take that to Congress and show them what, you know, what's become of this mess, right? Um, without a shadow of a doubt. So, and, and then it, again, there's other tribes that are coming up of, and they, these people were white people. They were not Indians. They're not misclassified Indians. They are white people that were slave masters and Creole slave masters that enslaved Indians and Africans, right? That are now claiming to be yeah. Native American. Very, very serious. 
Yes, there are people claiming to be native and using and doing name changes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> to get that status stuff. Absolutely. And then I didn't one realize last that, thing. Yeah, there was a oh, political um, American political party with Miss LeBlanc running. So um hopefully we can get her on the show and we can find get some information about what's going on um as we get ready for the 2024 political um landscape or yes, I'm Dr. Fontaine. And Ronaldo, once again, that is the American Indian yes. political party, heavy on the Indian part. American uh, we, Indian political yes. party, <laughs> um, and and that's that's very that's very yes. specifically near and dear to us because we're as we're supporting candidates like Miss Noreen. You know, yeah. we're very well aware, you know, on the national and federal level that within 450 days, we'll be in the midst of the 2024 election on yes. November 5th, Tuesday, November 5th, 2024. So we're very aware of the, the stakes that are coming up and we're calling all parties the carpet, you know, yeah. the, no matter what they're running for. We need to know individual stance where they stand if they support or if they're against the American yeah. Indian. And depending on the policies that they support, we will know. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. And um, and that's it for the show. And it was so powerful. Thank you guys again for coming on and sharing your perspectives. We're gonna have another show like this again. And um, just if you want to support um, the Urban Indian Heritage Society, can you help um, give us what your website? What's your website address? It is uh, Urban Indian Heritage Society dot org. Urban Indian Heritage Society dot org. Follow them on Twitter, Urban Indian Heritage Society. Phoenix Moon is on Facebook as well, LinkedIn, and on YouTube. Follow, follow, subscribe on YouTube as well. And Dr. Fontaine is also on Twitter, and he's available uh, as um, as Corn Pop. And um, Facebook, <laughs> Facebook is what um, as Nolan Fontaine, LinkedIn, Dr. Nolan Fontaine. Support the efforts. Visit the um, the petition at change.org. They have a petition. Please go visit it, and you can find the petition by going on their website. If you go to theneoliberal.com as well, there is a link to the petition as well. So visit, support, learn more about what's going on in your country and what you and how you can get involved. This is quite powerful. We, this is the Nailable Our Own Podcast, which is part of the Nailable Corporation, which is serving the world today to solve tomorrow's challenges by making popular always the monopoly. And just so you know, my next book is about to drop Nailable Globalization Reconsidered, Neo-Capitalism and the Death of Nations. Check that out. And if you haven't gotten the first book, it's available all over. And um, we're about to go live. We're about to do we're about to do some major stuff here at the Neoliberal Corporation. But I want to thank everybody. Thank um, the UIHS for coming on the show. We're going to partner with them. We're going to be supporting them. We're going to be promoting the petition and because this is important. Any, any, any more words from you guys as we wrap up? That's about it. Uh, I do. Um, really yes, brief. Yes. I want to say thank you. Always a gracious host, Ronaldo. I will, I will come back anytime uh, you invite us to. Uh, for your students, if they have specific genealogy questions, they hit a brick wall and they need any assistance, please um, forward them my email um, and just let them put, you know, uh, that they're one of your students or people in your collective and its subject and ask whatever questions I'll help them find and locate any documentation or show them where they can find the information. Okay, I don't have your email, so I'll probably get it from Nolan in a second. I mean, you may have given it to me, but I can't find it. That would be great. I hear some of the students, a lot of the students, is, and it's not just the students, it's a lot of people are having some problems. So it would be great. Phoenix Moon and the UIHS, they're involved in um, forensic genealogy, and they provide some of those services and some of those support, which is instrumental in helping people to rediscover and to reconnect with their lineage and their heritage, which is quite important. And I talk about Caribbean theology and Caribbean thought is about that. It's important for us to study those subjects because part of Caribbean theology is to, rec is to help to reclaim cultural identity. And when you study people, if you study Jewish societies, you know, part of the religion they have, part of that particular religion was cultural because it helps them to maintain that connection with their heritage in a sense. So, you know, all of this is part, 
this part of convers the, the conversation, this conversation is quite powerful and the work of UIHS is profound, it's pivotal, it's very important because people try to define you and then control you. So what you guys do is very instrumental to mitigate and to prevent that. Thank you guys. I am Ronaldo McKenzie, what good. And that's the end. And by the way, oh, we're going to make this available. We're going to make a premiere. We're going to make this available on YouTube. It's available on Facebook Live. We're going to sign out now, but we're going to edit it and record it and make it nice and beautiful and put it up live. It's going to be available on the podcast, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple, so on and so forth, Google, Amazon, the Audible, all of them. They, you can check it out. And it's going to be on video, on Spotify, and on our YouTube channel. Subscribe and share. What good.